Now this is all hand dyed, as she was in some of the things you see in Oriental theatre where they wear great big manes. This is made from Greece. How's this? Now Claire's going to turn around and have a look at the back of it. This is an amazing creation of applicants. The elderly couple was driving south along Clarencetown Road at Glen Oak, two kilometres north of Seaham, when the driver lost control of the car and slammed into a tree. Police and ambulance were called just after 8.30. Ambulance paramedics resuscitated the 71-year-old female passenger at the scene. She had suffered massive chest injuries. She was taken by the Westpac chopper to John Hunter Hospital in a critical condition. Mrs Rankin later died at the hospital. Her 68-year-old husband who was driving the vehicle suffered minor chest injuries. He was taken by road to Maitland Hospital. Traffic was slowed to a crawl as police cleared the scene. The accident investigation squad is looking into the incident. It's thought the car may have had mechanical problems. Peter Ryan, NBN News. The state government plans to spend more than $410 million on key services in the Hunter this financial year. Economist Roy Green says the budget is a vote-buying exercise by the Fay government to win the next election. While the budget will undoubtedly be beneficial to people in the Hunter in the short term, given the uh, choice of projects uh, and capital spending, uh, nevertheless in the longer term there is still a deficit issue. Much of the government's shopping list for the Hunter had already been made public. Yesterday's budget just confirmed the money would be in the bank. As expected, health received a boost. $1.6 million for Newcastle's Mata Hospital, $22 million to continue work on Maitland Hospital in the marginal Liberal seat. Also for the Maitland electorate, confirmation of the $4 million train station at Metford, as announced by the Minister last month. Education was also a winner, $13 million to be spent on school and TAFE buildings. Honeysuckle will get $32 million this year and Rhodes $154 million. But ultimately, of course, uh, the debt issue has to be addressed and uh, taxpayers, in the end, uh, will have to foot the bill. Jane Anderson, NBN News. Twenty-two-year-old David Peeney was shot three times by Highway Patrol Officer Constable Anthony Vanderflet on Tuesday. An hour after being discharged from hospital today, he was in Newcastle Court, charged with seven offences, including assault, robbery and using an instrument to avoid arrest. The court was told how Peeney had assaulted a student at Newcastle University and stolen his car. He then drove highly erratically with two flat tyres to Hamilton. There he crashed into two vehicles, threatening the driver of one. The policeman, who was directed to the area by witnesses, called on the defendant to drop the knife he was carrying. Two warning shots were fired, however police say it had no effect. Peeney was shot three times after he tried to grab a passing pedestrian, but even though he was wounded, he kept advancing toward the officer. He was eventually arrested when other police arrived. Detective Sergeant Lance Chaffee, who's heading an investigation into the shooting, told the court that Peeney had intimated to several police medics and family members that he wanted to go to a police station in Newcastle with a knife and confront police with a view of being fatally shot. Evidence was given that Peeney had in the past tried to kill himself three times. 
In light of Penny's suicidal tendencies, Magistrate Col Elliott ordered he be kept in custody in Long Bay Prison Hospital where a full psychiatric assessment would be undertaken. He adjourned the matter for two weeks. Jody McKay, NBN News. After five days of competition, the Waratah Round Robin was down to two bowlers. Recent Commonwealth Games bronze medalist Rob Perella from the Coolangatta Club in Queensland and Victorian state champion Mark Jacobson from Mooney Ponds. In the first round, Perella won by a single shot, but in the final, Jacobson was immediately on target. Perella tried to counter with power. But the $8,000 prize money looked Jacobson's for the taking when he established an early 12-6 lead. Perella used all of his international experience to try to get back in the match, but the Victorian countered every ploy. Jacobson taking out the match 31-21 to become the 33rd winner of the prestigious round robin. Richard O'Leary, NBN News. The current crippling conditions has stirred many communities into action. The Clarence Valley is no exception. Rotary clubs in the area have bought 4,000 bales of hay grown on Michaelo Island in the Lower Clarence to give to some of Queensland's drought-stricken farmers. The fodder was loaded on trucks in Grafton today, ready for a four-day trip to Quilpy in southwestern Queensland. Lending a hand, New South Wales Agricultural Minister and Member for Clarence Ian Causley and Federal Member for Page Harry Woods. This is a, a really good effort by the local Clarence Valley community and uh, I think you'll see it throughout Australia as the Australian community comes together to help their fellow Australians. The manoeuvre is a real community effort with the trucks supplied free of charge by various organisations and drivers donating their time. And while the fodder supply will offer a slight reprieve for farmers, its fingers crossed Mother Nature will step in and do her bit. We hope we can get some rain before, uh, before it gets too desperate. Amanda Bolger, NBN News. Rucker collided with Sydney's Dean Utoff in the third minute of the second quarter last night. The point guard completed the match and while x-rays were inconclusive, Newcastle coach Tom Wisman said today doctors believe Rucker has fractured ribs which could keep him out of the game for two weeks. It topped off a frustrating night for the Falcons, Newcastle stumbling to a 116-94 loss. Falcons were never in the match, Sydney always comfortably ahead. Meantime in cricket, Newcastle has recorded a comfortable win over the Hunter CHS side at University. Electing to bat, CHS scored 179 off their allotted 50 overs. Todd Campbell scoring 44 and Adam Logan tie 39, while paceman Jamie Heath and Simon Dillon captured five wickets between them. In reply, Newcastle lost just two wickets, scoring the runs in 39 overs, with David Willits unbeaten on 74 and Greg Charlton 43 not out.
Poetic King returned 280 for the win and 160 for the place. Trainer Lee Friedman now contemplating a run in the Epsom. To Caulfield's other feature, the Underwood Stakes over 1,800 metres. Jern upsetting Mahogany with yet another eye-catching performance from Paris Lane to run on for second to Sydney where Newcastle's potential star contested the Hill Stakes over 1,900 metres. Slight chance defying the critics, returning 7.40 for the win and 2.10 for the place. Running into a stiff breeze in the first half, a Christian Jones field goal gave Maitland a 3-0 lead, which wasn't retrieved until the 30th minute, a Craig Bates penalty levelling the scores. Two minutes later, Singleton crossed for the first try of the match, winger Scott Dalabozic giving the Bulls an 8-3 lead. Both sides added further penalty goals before the break. Singleton unlucky not to cross for another five-pointer after a charge down from Darren Hobden. Using the breeze to their advantage in the second term, Taylor slotted another penalty goal before relentless charges by Christian Adams and Eddie Mower resulted in a try to halfback Matthew Bauer. Another penalty goal increased the lead to 17-11, which was maintained. Maitland's determined defensive effort holding the Bulls out in the last 10 minutes. The grand finals, Hamilton, Merriweather, Carlton and Wanderers all had victories. Coal is Australia's biggest export earner, but unions say the federal government and coal producers are selling out to the Japanese. The coal union, the CFMEU, commissioned a survey to find out what the public thinks. It polled 10 marginal labour electorates, including two seats on the central coast, Dobell and Robertson, and Patterson in the Hunter. It shows nearly six out of ten voters want coal producers to work as a team when negotiating with Japanese buyers. Less than half that number want the coal producers to maintain the status quo and negotiate contracts individually. The survey is part of the coal union's ongoing attempt to get the federal government to back the cartel plan. The latest results come less than a fortnight before the ALP National Conference and only months before the verdict of the Taylor inquiry into coal prices. The Coal Association, which represents producers, has opposed the cartel, calling it impractical. Richard O'Leary, NBN News.
Each year in Australia, hundreds of children travelling unrestrained in cars involved in accidents are injured. Many are killed. A lot of the injuries could have been avoided by using approved child restraints. But simply purchasing a capsule isn't the answer. Correct installation is vital. Rob Johns, based at the John Hunter Hospital, is certified by the Roads and Traffic Authority to install capsules. He's currently conducting a 12-month RTA-sponsored survey assessing child restraints. We're inspecting that restraints that are being used are used correctly and that they're the most suitable restraint for that child, for that age of that child. Also that uh, they're not unsafe or, or dangerous or hazardous, hazardous because of perhaps uh, faulty buckles. The number of faulty capsules found is alarming. I've inspected 200 now uh, since June or 1st of July and we've found that the, the numbers are around about unfortunately about 80 per cent. Mr Johns aims to inspect 4,000 capsules free of charge. The results he compiles will then be passed on to the RTA. If the survey reveals deficiencies it may lead to the authority recommending changes be made to national child restraint standards or design rules. Catherine Lamond, NBN News. Glendale's $23 million mall type centre will be built on 19 and a half hectares along Lake Road. Development approval for the Stockland Trust project was granted two months ago. Last night, Council approved the building application. The complex will feature 25,000 square metres of retail space, two large supermarkets, fast food restaurants, a number of specialty discount stores and 1,700 spaces for cars. The developer is still to deal with access for people with disabilities and drainage matters, but is confident the project will be finished in time for Christmas trade next year. Meanwhile, plans to expand Charlestown Shopping Square are moving along with the possibility that the Hunter may get its first Target discount department store. Lendlease Retail wants to enlarge the existing Franklin supermarket, build more specialty retail stores, as well as 430 additional car spaces. Negotiations are underway with Target's owners. Last night, plans were presented to Council for the first time. Lendlease says these will be available for public inspection next month. A development application is expected to be lodged within the next few weeks. If approved, it's hoped the expansion, believed to be well in excess of $30 million, will be completed by early 1996. Melinda Smith, NBN News. The Lower Hunter is preparing for a population boom, the result of an overspill from Sydney. Sydney's got a problem in that it's, uh, it's growing so rapidly that uh, they need to look at expanding and they're in fact talking about what they call the overspill from Sydney into Newcastle. As the city's strategic planner, John Rees has the job of effectively managing the changes ahead, which he outlined at the Newcastle Business Club today. Newcastle Council is preparing for the rush. Last week, Planning Minister Robert Webster approved more land for housing development at Maryland. But according to Mr Rees, that's the least of our problems. Growth, he claims, should be led by job creation. Figures show of all the new jobs created in the past decade, one in three people in the Hunter now work in Sydney and the Central Coast. Ironically, better transportation links have drawn people away from the area in search of work. Historically, I think you can show that in fact the jobs have come and then the people have followed. And I think it's the way it ought to be. The, I think the challenge is to make sure that happens, otherwise we'll end up becoming simply a, a dormitory suburb for Sydney. The Pink Ladies are volunteers who, through various activities, raise money for Royal Newcastle Hospital. 
Until last October, their two gold phones made a profit, but then they received a phone bill which was $2,500 more than it should have been. I nearly fainted. Some users of gold phones have manipulated the follow-on button so that for the price of a local call, they can ring long distance. It's known even overseas calls have been made. Consequently, some gold phone owners are receiving large bills for unpaid calls. Since the phones were introduced 16 years ago, the network's technology has become more advanced, ironically making it easier to beat the system. And restores dial tone to the caller so that the caller can place an outgoing call without depositing any money. In order to prevent the fraud occurring, gold phone owners should contact Telecom to have the follow-on button disconnected or the phone modified. Telecom has known about the potential for fraud for about a year. It has sent several letters to phone owners but can't trace them all. None of the phones have been recalled. To recall them all and try to fix them all it would have pulled many phones out of service. What is disturbing for the pink ladies is that since the anti-fraud device was installed, the phone bills still haven't tallied. Telecom is investigating, but the question of who will foot the pink ladies bill is yet to be decided. If we have to pay it, then we'll have to get rid of that gold phone. We can't run the risk of an account like that again. Jane Anderson, NBN News. Cardiff's Elizabeth Heslop and Central Coast gymnasts Jackie Cully, Donna White and Paul Sainall were in Newcastle on the weekend for a statewide competition, their last one before heading to Portugal with the Australian team for the World Championships. 20-year-old Heslop is the best tumbler in the country. She finished seventh at the 92 World Championships in New Zealand and believes she can better that this time round. Donna White is Australian double mini and trampoline champ. She too is no stranger to international competition, having placed second in the double mini tramp at the 92 World Championships. It's in this event she predicts Australia will excel in Portugal. In double mini is our best chance in that we're at the moment our girls women's team is third in the world. We came third last world and the guys came fifth. The team will spend a week training and acclimatising before beginning competition on October 6th. Catherine Lamond, NBN News. An orange glow hung over Raymond Terrace's fires raged through bushland. A gusty wind fanned the blaze past houses into water corporation land. It was a long night for the small army of firefighters monitoring the blaze. Fifty people were on the job including New South Wales fire, bushfire and water corporation workers. With no immediate threat to homes, firefighters are letting the blaze go through the tinder dry bush. 400 hectares of land were blackened and as dawn broke there was no respite. The fires sparked again, leading to the closure of Richardson Road near Grahamstown Dam, forcing traffic to turn back. The flames so intense that firefighters were warned to take special care. Remember it's running along the edge towards you now mate, I'd just watch your tail if I were you. Strong shifting winds made it almost impossible for the firefighters to plan their attack. Spot fires broke out hundreds of metres away. The front don't stay a front for very long and we've got flanks becoming front so that's the, uh, the, the major problem we have. Tonight the fires are expected to burn out with no threat to property but a total fire ban should remain in force for the Port Stephens Shire for at least a month. Peter Ryan, NBN News.
For many, it was the most nerve-wracking 20 metres of their lives. Hundreds turned out to watch the talents of entrance, tiny tots to adults, strut their stuff, one in swashbuckling style. The 70 finalists were narrowed from an initial 400 hopefuls from the central coast to Coffs Harbour. Most entrants named their ambition to model professionally, but there was another popular goal. The national and international successes of previous winners as well as modelling contracts and holidays on offer proved a healthy motivation to enter the contest. Three winners were announced for under eight years, junior teenage and adult sections, the major prize going to 16-year-old Adamstown schoolgirl Katrina Hill. Farmers are struggling under the burden of drought, but soon the cost of the big dry may be shared beyond the farm gate. Newcastle Produce Market is predicting a rise in the price of fruit and vegetables. Probably more so our leafy uh, veggies, ones that sort of need a lot of uh, irrigating to sort of grow. While prices haven't been affected yet, if there's no substantial rain, prices will jump by Christmas. Uh, the fruit quality could still be good, but you won't get as much of it. However, Leanne Maven says the drought won't mean supplies will dry up. If we don't source it out of one area, we can sort of get it from some, somewhere else. So don't, don't panic, you'll still be able to feed the family, no problems at all. Jane Anderson, NBN News. This is the collision that has Derek Rucker walking on a fitness tightrope. And if he falls, the whole team could come down with him. Dean Utoff has since been exonerated, but Rucker says it sets a precedent for other players, pointing to a hard-hitting final series. It was a rough play. Um, there was no penalty, so whatever comes of it, however, each, uh, I'm not sure how each club will handle it. They could look at it and uh, make up their own minds about uh, you know, what they feel that they're allowed to do on the court now. Rucker is undergoing intense physio in a bid to play for the Falcons against the North Melbourne Giants this weekend, a match that could decide the team's playoffs fate. Rucker is confident he'll take the court, but his doctors aren't convinced. Ooh, we're looking probably 70 to 30 against. After being out of the league for two years and now getting a chance to come back and actually compete in the playoffs and, and being able to make a difference in whether or not we get there, um, I, I'm just not going to miss the game, so simple as that. Richard O'Leary. NBN News. Police had initially gone to the property near Inverell on another matter when they came across the discovery. 33 semi-mature marijuana plants were found in pots. Police also allegedly found special lights which could be used to promote plant growth. A 35-year-old Inverell man has been charged with cultivating cannabis, possession of cannabis, a firearms offence and a receiving offence. Officers working on the case have removed the plants which will be destroyed. Peter Ryan, NBN News. It's been hailed as a world-class venue for dumping rubbish. 20 years in the planning, Summerhill's Waste Management Facility is designed to take the city and its garbage into the next century. The $10 million project includes advanced technology for recycling, an education centre, bushwalks, even an exhibition hall. High technology is the fact that there will be no leachate into the ground 
the leachate will be totally controlled and it will be a totally controlled environment. Council representatives signed a deal with Abbey Group, the company that will build the facility's infrastructure. It's expected the site will be ready for use by June next year. But such a facility doesn't come cheap and users can expect a hike in dumping fees. Every load of rubbish will be measured, the new charge estimated at nearly $20 a tonne. In view of the fact that we're going to reduce that waste stream by 50%, everyone's going to save money because they're not going to be spending the money they're spending now on getting rid of waste because most of it will be recycled. Melinda Smith, NBN News. There is little left after the blaze tore through Water Corporation land east of Raymond Terrace. The fires are out, but another battle has begun to search for koalas which survived the inferno. Probably 50% of the koalas we're getting are going to be dead. A colony of about 200 koalas live in the 400 hectare stretch of bush. This morning rescuers came across a mature female stranded in the treetops. The tiny marsupial obviously terrified. After some skillful and patient work, she eventually came down. And for the rescuers some relief, this koala has somehow escaped serious injury in the fire. The greatest fear for rescuers is that baby koalas may have been separated from their mothers and killed in the fires. One dead cub has already been found. The Native Animal Trust is calling for public help to scour the bush tomorrow and over the weekend looking for koalas. The number to call is 018 689 134. Peter Ryan, NBN News. With an extreme fire warning in place, 16 teams of firefighters went to work at Pacific Power's northern centre beside the university. The teams from power stations across the state are fine-tuning their skills in the case of a real emergency on the workplace. They were put through a series of tests judged by special fire brigade officers. Speed and obviously getting the fire out, high point winners. The Newcastle area was the winning team from Yass and Munmora on equal second, Vales Point power station third. <laughs> 